We'll be looking at Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 this morning. And as you're turning there, I'll just remind you that the revelation of Jesus Christ, as it's called in chapter 1, verse 1, was given as a letter to real churches in real cities in Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. Seven churches were Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We uh, have those on a map uh, here for you. We've pointed those out earlier. As John received this revelation of Jesus Christ, he was just off to the southeast of uh, where you see the cities marked in Turkey on a little island called Patmos. One, uh, one commentator says, all seven churches were under the persecution of the Roman emperor Domitian, who reigned from AD 81 to 96. And by this time, certain methods of persecution had been developed. People were being boiled in oil, strung up by their fingers. Fingers. Uh, they had things pushed underneath their finger, fingernails, and then they would be killed. All seven of these churches existed in the midst of that kind of serious persecution. Persecuted for their missionary zeal, their obedience to the king of kings, their refusal to bow down to idols and they were rumored even to be cannibals because the Lord's Supper was not understood by the Romans. Whatever age in which we may live as believers in Christ and have lived throughout all of church history, these are, while messages for individual local churches of that day, in the wisdom and providence of God, they are messages for us today. And there is tremendous prophetic importance in those churches because their messages represent the total message to the total church. I said last week as we begin to look through these seven letters to the seven churches, particularly in chapters 2 and 3, what we're going to find is pretty much if you get right what they got right, and if you correct what they needed to correct, you'll have a healthy church. So it's real simple. All we got to do is everything that we're going to see in the seven letters to the seven churches, okay? Just keep track and get to work. So over the next seven weeks, that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look through uh, these seven letters, Jesus' words to each of these seven churches, and we want to allow his searching eyes to examine our hearts. Individually, yes, but as a church. For the risen and reigning King is worthy of our faithful obedience and worship we continue our study of the book of Revelation this morning. We've been uh, looking at this book under the heading of Seeing Your Returning, Your Reigning and Returning King. Today we're going to hear Jesus' words to the church in Ephesus. What do we know about Ephesus? Well, it was located on the west coast of Asia Minor. Uh, and a messenger traveling from Patmos would have come to uh, Ephesus first. So as he brought this revelation to, uh, from John on, on Patmos to the church at Ephesus, then he would have come to that city first. Ephesus was the de facto capital of the province because of its economic strength, its religious activities. It was known as the Vanity Fair of Asia, if you will. To visit Ephesus in the first century would be like a visit to Los Angeles or New York City today. We're told that it was one of the largest cities, uh, some say the second largest, some say the fourth largest, in the Roman Empire, second only or fourth only to Rome, with at least half a million people living in the city at its zenith. In Ephesus, there was a church started by Paul, led by Timothy, taught by Apollos, served by Aquila and Priscilla, and attended by Mary, the mother of Jesus, after her and John, the apostle, moved down to pastor this church. Imagine going to church with that crowd. And yet, as you're going to see, while this church had a lot of good things going, they weren't perfect. And they'd already begun to slide on one of the main things. Doing a lot of things right. This church was not a, an old church. 
Our church is 130-something years old. This church was probably only 40 to 50 years old. You can kind of count on it. If you're not careful in church, the older a church gets, the more likely it is to begin to drift away from Christ. Which just goes to show, as Louis Giglio says, depreciation happens quickly in the human heart. I mean, understand this church, founded by Paul, early on pastored by Timothy, taught by Apollos. Aquila and Priscilla were there. John comes to pastor and brings Jesus' mother with him. And yet, just a few short years later, we find a church, the title of today's message, a church with everything but the main thing. A church with everything but the main thing. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Here's the take-home truth. A church can have everything else right, but be on the verge of judgment because its love has grown cold. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, Jesus speaking, write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Just a quick comment there. Church is plural. He's writing to a singular church at this point, isn't he? The church at Ephesus. What's that all about? Well, Just clearly, Jesus wants all the churches to read each other's letters and benefit, just like we're doing, going through all seven letters. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What do we learn from this letter to the church at Ephesus? A church can have everything else right, but be on the verge of judgment Because its love has grown cold. Uh, Before we get started with the message today, I want to just show you a quick format, a five-fold format that each of these seven letters has. Just uh, in general at least, and and there'll be some variation, but in general, this is the way the letters are, are laid out. The first thing we see in each of the seven letters is the confrontation of Christ. Jesus said, this is who says, this is who I am. Before I tell you what I need to tell you, I want you, to, I want you to see me this way. And he describes himself. Then we see the commendation of Christ. He commends the church, at least most of them, for something. The good things they're doing, where they are being faithful. And then he gets to the criticism, where they're not doing so hot. At least in most cases. And then he gives the correction of Christ. And finally, the conqueror's reward. If you get these things corrected, if you correct your problems, if you repent and get back to where you need to be on the issues addressed, then there will be a reward, the conqueror's reward to come from Christ. In the case of the church at Ephesus, verse 1 gives us the confrontation of Christ. We'll see Jesus confront each church with who he is in the way that is most pertinent, apparently, to their situation. He says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus right, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Notice, he's gone back and drawn from the description that Seth read earlier of Jesus 
the vision of Christ in, in chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. You'll be able to see it as we go through all seven letters. He takes a portion of that vision, that description of Jesus, and uses it to announce himself to the church. In this case, he wants Ephesus, a church with everything but the main thing, to see him as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Jesus needs to be seen as the one who sovereignly holds every angel and church in his mighty ruling and reigning right hand. And that means a couple of things for us. Our church is not our church. Amen? It's Jesus' church. Secondly, we are secure in his mighty right hand. He holds us in his right hand hand. But also in Ephesus, a church again with everything but the main thing, Jesus needs to be seen as the one who dwells among his people and sees and knows all about us, what we think, what we say, what we do. The words of him who not only holds the angels in the right hand, but who walks among the seven golden lampstands. He walks among us. Jesus, listen to me, Jesus is here. Not, not because we're in this building, but because he indwells us, each one, as believers by his Spirit. He is in the middle of his church. He is walking in our midst. And verse 2 goes on to say, Jesus begins to speak now, I know. By the way, in each of the seven letters that follow, six letters that follow this one, Jesus' first words are, I know. Jesus is here today. He's walking in our midst. And Jesus knows everything there is to know about me. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows the entirety of East L.J. Baptist Church and all there is to know about us both individually and together. And he says, I know. I know. Which brings us to his commendation there in verses 2 and 3 and also verse 6. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear evil with those Bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Verse 6, yet this you have, you hate the, the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The commendation of Christ. Jesus said, I, I'm among you. I'm walking among you, and I know what you're doing. I know all of the good things, all of the, 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 the faithful ways of your church. I know about your good works, verse 2. Your toil, how you've labored for the gospel. I know about your patient endurance. I, I know that you're enduring patiently, verse 3 says, and Bearing up for my name's sake. I know you've not grown weary. Again, this is a church that lived in the midst of persecution. They were being persecuted from the outside. To follow Jesus cost them something. And yet they hadn't thrown in the towel. They hadn't quit. They'd remain faithful. They were enduring the opposition and the persecution. Jesus said, I know that you have sound doctrine. I know you can't bear with those who are evil. You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. You found them to be false. You, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You've been very careful doctrinally. You're pure doctrinally. You've got the gospel clear and right. The message is true that you preach. Tom Schrainer says, we're not totally sure what the Nicolaitans taught, but we can guess from later on in verses 13 to 15 of this chapter that it involves sexual sin and idolatry. We learn that 
in, a, in another letter to the, to the churches. This church had taken doctrine very seriously. The truth of God's word very seriously. Uh, we can look back into the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 20, Paul met the, letter, the, the elders from this church of Ephesus on the, the beaches of Miletus, and there they had a conversation. And Paul encouraged them this way in Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and following. He says, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And then he exhorts those Ephesian elders, pay careful attention to, the, to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit's made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arrive men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And those Ephesian elders, in response to that, had apparently, according to John, taken Paul's warning seriously. They kept false teachers out of the church. They kept the gospel pure. The church at Ephesus hated evil, rejected the false teaching of the Nicolaitans about idolatry and sexual immorality, and they were persevering in the faith. But a church can have everything else right but be on the verge of judgment from Christ because its love has grown cold. And that brings us to the criticism of Christ for the church at Ephesus. In verse 4, Jesus says, man, you, you guys have got a lot going good. You, you've got so much that's solid. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. You've abandoned the love you had at at first. Their love had grown cold. Love for who? Well, they had fallen out of love with Jesus, apparently. And because of what Scripture teaches us, no doubt, their love, not just for God, but for each other, and maybe even the world around them, had grown cold. First John makes it clear that you can't say you love God and not love your brother. First John says... In 1 John 4, I believe, verse 20, it says, if you, if, if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you haven't seen? In other words, there's an inextricable link between love for God and love for our brothers and sisters in Christ and for our world. If you don't love your brother, simply said you don't love God. Love for Jesus Love for other believers, inextric inextricably linked together always. And if one of those loves cools off in our hearts, the other one is right there with it. No matter how orthodox and doctrinally careful and correct and hardworking in the kingdom we may be. As MacArthur says, you can be right theologically, but if you've lost your first love for Jesus Christ, that results in love for your brother's and sisters in Christ, then your theology is nothing but cold academics. In Isaiah 29, verses 13 and 14, the prophet, God through the prophet said, These people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. Ephesus was careful to check off all the doctrinal boxes. They had it all right. They were clear on the truth. They ran off false teachers, those fierce wolves that Paul had warned them about. And yet their hearts, in their hearts, their love for Christ, their, their, their worship of Christ, and their love and, and, and sacrificial service to one another had grown cold. Paul put it this way about our relationships, especially with one another. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am what? Nothing. Verse 3, if I give away all I have, 
And if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain how much? Nothing. Their love had grown cold. Robbie Gowdy said, Our love for others must outweigh our judgment of others. Does yours, does mine? They worked hard at church. They acted right in their personal lives. They kept following Jesus even when it was hard. Persecution, persecution didn't cause them to deny Jesus, but their hearts were cold. No passion in their worship of God. No flaming desire for Jesus. No treasuring of Christ in the heart about all things. No joy in the truth. No enthusiasm and urgency in telling the lost about Jesus. No intensity in their love for one another. No doubt their prayer life had grown cold. Their hearts weren't burning with that fire of love for Jesus and that, that love for others that, would move, that moves us to pray. To cry out to Jesus. To do what only He can do in our lives. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you what? Love one another. Just as I have loved you, the picture is there of the cross, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And by the way, John 13, verses 34 and 35 that we just read come right after the section in, the, in, in John's Gospel where Jesus had just gotten up from the Passover, taken off His outer cloak and wrapped Himself in a towel and knelt before His disciples and washed their feet. And essentially said, this is how you're to love one another. Jesus, even as he knelt before the twelve, he even washed Peter's feet. Peter, who within hours would deny that he even knew Jesus. And yes, he even washed the feet of Judas. Judas, who would betray him into the hands of the Romans, thus to the crucifixion. And then he says, after doing those acts of service to his disciples, to all of them, he says, if you love like I loved you, by washing your feet physically, but symbolically going to the cross and, and, and and, and, and doing even giving my whole life for you, if you love each other like I loved you, that's how they'll know that you're mine. Like you'll love in a different way than the world loves. How do we love just on our own? How does the world love? I do for you to benefit me. I don't die to me. There's always a motive. It ain't got nothing to do with you. I love you to serve me. And yet Jesus laid down his life. Jesus, the, the, the Lord of all, knelt and, 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 and did the menial work of, of, of the lowest of the house slaves of washing feet. More than that, he went to the cross. Though pure and sinless, undeserving, he went to the cross and died a criminal's death for me because of my sin. He bore in his own body, Peter says, my sins when he hung on that tree and for you and so he says just as I've loved you you're also to love one another and when you do then the world will know that you're my disciples later on Jesus would say in Matthew 24 because lawlessness will be increased the love of many will grow cold and the one who endures to the end will but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Persecution had come to the church at Ephesus, and the result was, while staying doctrinally pure, their love had begun to grow cold. Their love 
for Jesus, their love for one another, the warmth of our love for Jesus, the passion of our hearts for Him. Listen to me, it matters. If our hearts grow cold, if our endurance in the faith is seriously, uh, then, our, then our, faith, our endurance in the faith is seriously threatened and in danger of running out. And chances are, listen, chances are we won't endure to the end. Which brings us to the correction of Christ. So how do we correct cold hearts? What do we do about this fall in our hearts from that place of, 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 of the love we had when we first came to Christ? The correction of Christ is given in verse 5. Remember, Jesus said, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. And do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The church at Ephesus needed to repent. But Jesus says, first of all, you need to remember. You need to remember how you first loved me. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Do you remember the joy? Do you remember the childlike love and, and, and devotion? The simple love. You had for Jesus at first. Do you remember it? Do you remember how you could easily look over quirks and differences and personality clashes with other believers, other folks at church, because you knew and still felt deeply how amazing God's grace was toward you and all of your many sins and quirks and oddities? You see, we're warned here by Jesus himself to never forget that to never forget how that was we're warned by Jesus to always keep that fire burning to always live at that place of our first love it's true in marriage isn't it man you court guys you courted her somehow you won her And you get married, and over time, you just kind of settle into this routine. And all that, all that passion, all that desire, all of that excitement, all that love simply said that you felt at the beginning, it, it fades. And, and all of a sudden, you're not doing the same things for her you did at the beginning. You're not, you're not acting the same way. And, and, and ladies, maybe it goes the other way too. I'm just going to stay on my side of that deal. Amen. Betsy's not here today, but she's watching, so, you know. <laughs> How many times I've heard someone say, I'm just not, I just, I'm, I'm just not in love anymore. As they come and contemplating divorce. Well, it's because you've fallen from the place you were at first and you're, you've not continued to do the things that you did throughout. It's true in our relationship with Jesus. Listen to me. It's true in relationship to one another in the church. Being family members is kind of like marriage. It's not the same. I got it. But it's, it's kind of like. Happy families work at being happy and loving each other. Forgiving each other. Overcoming those difficult things. Well, how do we do that? How do we remember? How do we stay in that place? Well, we not, don't just remember, we repent. We repent of a cold, loveless heart. Repent. And he goes on to say, if you don't, if not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What does it mean to repent? It means to confess it and turn from it, to cry out to Jesus in prayer for a heart that burns hot with love for him Again and again, it's to cry out in the words of David, Restore to me, O Lord, create in me a clean heart, and restore, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Did my salvation ever change? No. But the joy of my salvation, apparently of David's, had changed. And in that context, David had been confessing sin. He had sinned against God. Salvation never changed, but his joy in that, in that salvation had changed. In fact, he found joy in something called sin more than he found joy in Christ in that moment. And the same thing is true for you, for me. Repent. 
then in the midst in the midst of a lawless world whose hearts are passionate for every kind of thing in sin and everything but Jesus, we must daily stoke the fire of love in our hearts by, uh, for Him by preaching the gospel to ourselves again, going back to the Word of God, soaking our heart in the Word of God, crying out to Him in prayer. Prayer in the Word, prayer in the gospel. It's the same formula. It's the same cure every time. In the Christian life, is it not? Go back to the cross every day and see the one who loved you so much, he willingly laid down his life for you. And even if the affections of your heart don't immediately warm back up, keep crying out to him to rekindle that fire, even as you then, as Jesus calls us to do, return to the works you did when your heart was white hot for Jesus. Do the works you did at first. Repent. Remember, repent. And return. Remember, repent, and return to those first works. Do the stuff that kept the fire alive to begin with. Pastor H.B. Charles said the first works are whatever you did when you loved Christ at first. Go back to the basics. Pray, read the Bible, worship, fellowship. Uh, that is, love others, serve, give, witness. Then he makes this statement, it is easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. Do whatever it takes to get closer to the Lord. I want to say that again because that's important. It is easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. Sometimes when our hearts grow cold, we just need to trust and obey without the warmth in our hearts knowing that as we've turned from it, we've repented, we've confessed it to God, we've turned from it, we've asked God, I want it to be, God, I want, I want, I want, I want to feel for you, I want my heart to burn for you like it did at first. I want to love others like I used to love others. Then we act and obey until our hearts are changed. If not, Jesus said, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, we've said from the beginning, first time we saw this, the lampstands are pictures of of, of local churches. And the picture here is Jesus walking among his churches. Jesus called us to be the light of the world. The picture of the lampstand is, is just a picture of the church shining the light of Christ to the world. And Jesus is present with us. And here he says, now the deal is, if you don't repent of your loveless state, if you don't repent of your lack of love for God and your lack of love for one another, then here's the deal. I'll just come and take your lampstand away. That's a dire warning. Take careful note here. This is the only church Jesus said he would personally come to and shut its doors if they didn't repent and start loving like they loved at first. A church that had everything but the main thing. They weren't sexually immoral. They weren't idolaters. They had everything but the main thing, which was love. A burning love for Jesus. Love that was sacrificial for one another, that looked like Jesus laying his life down on the cross in love and service of each other. I just want to commend you, first of all, we, 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 we talked about this for a couple of weeks now, just as Seth did last Sunday. Man, we saw the body of Christ come together and put on a wedding for Kayla Robertson in like a week. I know things some of the rest of y'all don't know about things going on in Sunday school classes. And what a beautiful thing it is. What if we all said, you know what? I'm going to love somebody this week more than anybody else loves anybody else in the church. How about that? What if we all just said, look, I'm, 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 I'm going to... I'm going, to find, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to show me a need to connect me with somebody that needs love. 
Now, that love may take the form of monetary help. It may take the form of prayer. It may take the form of a listening ear. It may take the form of, of, of really inconveniencing you in order that they might be helped. Are we willing to pray that way? What, what might God do? I mean, again, this church had everything, but the main thing, and Jesus said the main thing is that. That kind of love. And Jesus said, if you don't repent and get that fixed, then your church is going to cease to exist. That is, by the way, what ultimately happened. There is no Christian church in Ephesus today. Continued favor on a local church is never guaranteed. And so we hear this correction. Remember, repent, and return. Finally, this morning, we come to the conqueror's reward in verse 7. I I love that in every letter, Jesus holds out hope for all these churches. What a merciful and gracious Savior. How gracious of Him even to address their, their issues, to cry out to them for change and repentance. Verse 7, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then he gives this promise of the conqueror's reward. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Listen to what I'm saying. Do something about what I've told you. And the one who conquers, you'll be rewarded. You can know that If you respond to this call for repentance, if you make it right in in your church, then then I will grant to the conqueror to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Each letter will make a promise to the local church to whom it's written. It'll be made in the context of where they live to those who overcome, those who repent, those who conquer. And then we'll see it fulfilled later in Revelation 21 and 22, by the way. Overcomers will enjoy, according to this passage there in Ephesus, paradise restored for eternity, eating from the tree of life forever. Now, life in Ephesus was sensual and full of pleasures surrounding the temple of Artemis. It was was an affluent city. There were feasts all over the place, uh, many of them to idols and in the worship of idols. And Jesus says that the one who overcomes will eat the sweetest of fruits as they enjoy eternal life in the paradise of God. The one who repents of their loveless heart and, 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 and comes to God and, 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 and finds a heart burning hot for Him and a heart willing to lay down its life for its brothers will eat the sweetest of fruits in the paradise of God. Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, Bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on the other side, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And the implication is there there's there's fresh fruit every month. The leaves for the healing of the nations, the fruit for us to eat. All that a picture of eternal life. If the Ephesians would hear and respond, they could conquer their cold, loveless hearts. They were not beyond hope. They could, once again, be confident that they would forever eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. And so can we. It wasn't too late for any of them to repent and to return. As we'll see later, it wasn't too late even for the dead church at Sardis or the lukewarm church at Laodicea. And it's not too late for you. It's not too late for me. As long as we have breath and until Christ comes, it's not too late for East LJ Baptist Church. However, we may see ourselves in need of repentance. It's never too late. A church can have everything else right 
but be on the verge of, a ju of judgment because its love has grown cold. How full of love is East LJ Baptist Church today, both in its love for Jesus and his people, our brothers and sisters? God forbid that we ever be found to be a church with everything but the main thing. And so let me just ask you, what is the temperature of your heart? What's the temperature of my heart? If it's cooling, then we must fan the embers and stoke it back to white hot love for him and for one another. If your heart's already turned cold, then beg God for mercy and remember how it once was and go back to the first works and repent. Have you practically quit loving and serving others? Some of us have been in church a long time. Somebody say amen. So, I mean, decades. Some of y'all been in church longer than I've been alive. Maybe you've just gotten fed up with people and their moods. Hey, can anybody testify? Hello. My grandma used to say this world would be a pretty good place if it weren't for people. <laughs> Maybe you just kind of got, kind of got over it. Kind of got over the moods of people. And you pull back and you just keep to yourself and your family. You don't even like some of them, but you can't get away from them. Who do you sense that Jesus is right now calling you to serve? By His Spirit prompting you to check on. Spend some time with this week. Who is it that you need to kneel before with a basin and towel and Wash their feet. You know, no, that may involve something like Ephesians 4, where you forgive even as God in Christ forgave you. You forgive that other person. Maybe you need to go and ask forgiveness. Maybe you know it's actually that other way in that relationship. You see, this kind of love is the invitation this morning as we come to the Lord's table.